If you recall, last time we talked about uh, what we can read with the graph of the derivative. Uh, yesterday, we focused on the sign of the derivative telling us about the direction of the function. The sign of the derivative tells us the direction of the function. Sign of derivative. Tells us the direction of the function. The sign of the derivative tells us the direction of the function. Today, we want to look at one level below that, one derivative beyond this. And so today we want to look at the direction of the derivative that tells us about the concavity of the function. Direction of the derivative The direction of the derivative tells us about the concavity of the function. This is all from our sequence of talks about what the derivative can tell us. So we want look at the function, the derivative, and the second derivative. We looked at that sign, direction, and concavity. So the direction of the derivative tells us the concavity of the function. If we think about the second derivative, the sign of the second derivative tells us about the direction of the first derivative. So the sign of the second derivative tells us about the concavity of the function. But we're going to use this framing because we are looking at the derivative. So we see that on the graph of f prime, we can see that the um, f prime is increasing on the interval from zero to five. F prime is increasing on the interval from zero to five. So therefore we can say that F is concave up on the interval from zero to And then from five to six, we could say that uh, F prime is decreasing. So the graph, uh, so F is concave down. What this means, since the graph, uh, since f changes from concave up to concave down uh, at, five, uh, at five, we would say that f has an inflection point when x equals five. So from this, we, we might say that f has an inflection point at x equals five. Since the derivative is changing direction, the function is changing concavity. And that's what an inflection point is. Note that the derivative is still positive from two to five and from five to six. So the function is increasing 
It's just changing concavity. So the function is increasing and changing concavity. So from two to five, the function increases So from two to five, the function increases by 18. And from five to six, the function increases. Um, I mean, two and five, too close together. From two to five, the function increases by 18. And then from five to six, the function is still increasing. It increases by 12 from five to six. But we change concavity. The function changes concavity. Uh, we decrease by 10 on zero to two. So uh, if we draw, want to draw the graph of f, we'll draw decreasing to uh, from 0 to 2. Uh, increasing from 2 to 5 and increasing from 5 to 6. Concave up from 0 to 5. and then concave down from zero to six. Note that when I get to six, I don't wanna flatten the graph out. As we can see that the graph of F prime is still positive. Even though the graph of f prime is decreasing, it's still positive. So I don't want the graph to flatten out at 6. The graph should only be flat at x equals 2, because that's the only point where f prime is equal to 0. Horizontally, we started here at 50, drop down to 40. Up here, we're at 58. And up here, we're at seven. We have a local and global minimum at two of 40 and a global maximum at six, uh, at six of 70. And an inflection point at five will be changed from concave up to concave down. The function is still increasing, but the amount of increase is decreasing. Any questions? We want to be able to look at the graph, the derivative, read about, uh, read how much the function is, uh, what direction the function is going, how much it's going in each of those directions. And then we also want to look at the direction of the derivative and read about the concavity of the function. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, using the, yeah, once we have one point for our table of values of the function, then we can use the area to, uh, the area and the direction to determine other points. And then once we have all the points, it's uh, easy to plot the points and know what directions we need to go. But then we look at the direction of the derivative for the concavity. How are we going to bend the function? Without the concavity, we just like draw a line, draw a line, draw a line. But what we want to include is some kind of concavity in our drawing. How are we going to bend these lines a little bit?
Yeah, we're reading the derivative and the area between the derivative and the x-axis to see how much the function changes. But I always have to give you a starting point. I had to tell you something about the function. I could have said f of two is equal to 40. That's the one I, I picked. I could have started off with f of zero is equal to 50. Um, I could have given you any one of these points as long as you know the area going up to it and coming out of it. If I said that f of three is equal to whatever, some number, f of three is equal to 50, I'm kind of being a jerk because I haven't told you what's going on at three. I don't know the area from two to three or from three to five. So given this graph, it looks like I'm going to give you zero, two, five, or six. Those would be fair game for giving you a value. How's everybody okay? Now this is a generic problem because I wanted to talk about concavity. I wanted to uh, I wanted to come up with a graph. If we think about what applications we could use, the applications of um, the applications of the derivative are just what are our applications of slope? When we think about slope as being the rise over run, how something is changing, how is our function changing? That's the that's the use of the derivative. If we talk about area. Think about our application. If we want to think about applications of the integral, we use the integral here to tell us about area. Uh, we use the area version of definite integral to tell us how much the function is changing. But the applications of integration are just the applications of multiplication. Integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. Integration is about addition. Another word that we might use is to say integration is accumulation. We are accumulating things. That differentiates it a little bit from addition. Because when we think of addition, we think of that plus sign. We want to put the plus sign in between stuff. But when we have a continuum, there's nowhere to put the plus sign. So we modify our addition to think of to be accumulation. These are all the various ways we think about addition. So integration. is multiplication. In which one of the factors is continuously varied. Keep in mind, if two of the factors are continuously variable, then one of the factors is continuously variable. Right now in this room, one person has an A in the class because a lot of you have A's in the class. And so I picked it because it's easy. Integration is multiplication where one, in which one of the factors is continuously variable. We model this with our regular uh, uh, multiplication by taking out the continuously variable part so we could use multiplication. So in this way, integration is addition because addition is what we do when we can't multiply. Multiply means all the terms are the same, so then we get to multiply. If, we, if they're not all the same, then we have to add. And then to modify this to be continu a continuum, since there's nowhere to put the plus sign, we modify our integration as addition by thinking of it as accumulation. And we're thinking of accumulation as just like pouring water into a glass. The water accumulates in the glass. We are adding water to the glass and kind of making it. But at this point, we're playing semantics. Like when you go to the store and it's like all 10 items or less, you know what they mean. You don't have a continuum of items. You have a discrete set of items that you'd be like all 10 items or fewer. But no one gets a 
like, I'll come off it. I don't mind if the store is like, well, 10 items or fewer, unless they're going to be a dick about it. So we're thinking of accumulation as addition. But continuous. Always remember what we're doing. We're modeling the continuous with a discrete set. We're being computers. We can't do continuous, so we model it with the discrete set. The picture that you're looking up at here, it looks like this orange uh, bracket is a nice continuous curvy line. It is the way I wrote it, because I wrote it with a continuous line. But the computer is unable to display that. It's just giving you a bunch of points, and your brain is making it into a curvy line, because we're not looking at it very close. What? How's everybody okay? That's the trippiest thing about our perception and our memory. We didn't, we're not actually looking at this. Our brain is just putting that stuff together. Now, this is a point that I keep making because you're going to be going to Calc 2 and I'm not going to be your Calc 2 teacher. So you're going to be at someone else's Calc 2 student and they're going to talk about what integration is. And I want you to remember integration is multiplication, but one of the factors is continuously variable. You're going to do all kinds of applications of integration. And I want you to see every time there's an application of integration, it's just going to be a multiplication. Area is equal to length times width. The one that we do a lot in this class Distance is equal to rate times time. But instead of the rate just going constant, the rate's like all, whoa. But we still take the distance as this rate multiplied by the time down here. The rate up here times the time down here. You can't see me at home. I'm using my hands to be like the rate up here and then the time down here. It's just an area. But it's area where our length is continuously variable. It's a multiplication where our rate is continuously variable. How's everybody okay? I'm also going to do all kinds of techniques of integration. I'm really bummed that I'm going to be missing out on that. It's so fun and so useless at the same time. Any questions about reading the graph of the derivative? Remember, if you walk into my top two final, or you look at a problem on Canvas and you're looking at a graph, that's probably the graph of a derivative. And I want you to read the sign of the derivative, to determine the direction of the function. I want you to look at the direction of the derivative to talk about, to read the concavity of the function. Those are the kinds of things that I want. All the questions I'm gonna be asking are variations on that theme. Where is the function increasing? Where is the function decreasing? Where is the function concave up? Where is the function concave down? I'm sorry, but okay. If I want to do an application, then I might make this a velocity graph because velocity is the one in the middle. It's the derivative of position. So I said, well, where is the position increasing? Where is the position decreasing? What's the acceleration of the function? Now I want the derivative of the graph that you're looking at because acceleration is the derivative of velocity. And that's the one that I probably use. It's the most popular one. We need to face the fact that calculus is an engineering class, even though it's sitting in the math department. Well, they're all engineers, right? The students are like, oh, no. And calculus is like, oh, yes. Well, no, I'm a physicist. You'll be an engineer when you want to. And one student's like, well, I'm a math major. 
and I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I've already had one math major this year. You can't, I can't have a second one. There are laws against this stuff. Any questions? Comments? Snipe remarks? All right, that's all we need to talk about with uh, reading the graph, the derivative. So um, that's it for today. Uh, I will see you all on tomorrow where we'll look at the derivative in table form. Just a slight variation of this. That's it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow. Have a good day and thanks for playing.